Good afternoon, welcome back to Virology. Today we are starting the second half of the course where we're gonna talk about viruses infecting host organisms. And today we're gonna to talk about principles that we need to understand to understand what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of this course. In a host in nature, the virus genome needs to endure. It needs to get into the host, it needs to multiply, it needs to get out. I say the genome because you know, the shell is just a carrier. It's all about the genome. If the genome doesn't persist, it ends. And that's not something that we needed to deal with when we talked about virus infection of cells and culture. As you can see by this dish here, all we did was add virus, it would reproduce, kill the cells, and that's the end of it. It doesn't go anywhere else. So obviously there's a big difference in what we've talked about uh, so far and what we're gonna talk about for the rest of this class. On the other hand, there are similarities, of course. What happens in cells and culture probably to some extent happens in the infected host. Uh, and in both cases, the virus needs to get into the cells, they need to get out. But for the host, there's an additional complication, and that is the virus has to get in the host, and then it gets in cells, gets out of those cells, and then gets uh, to another host. And this whole process of getting out sometimes causes disease. It's not an intentional thing. It doesn't benefit host uh, viruses in any way, but it happens. It's, I would say it's a corollary of a virus infection, but many infections do not cause disease as you'll see today. And, and you know, in lecture one, I said, we live and prosper in a cloud of viruses. Live and prosper are the key words, right? You may say that's incongruous. How can that be? No, viruses don't all kill everyone, uh, in fact, even with terrible pandemics, they don't kill everyone. Uh, stories and newspapers would like you to think that one day a virus could emerge that would kill everyone, but that's nonsense. It's not gonna happen. Why? Because, well, now we have great ways of intervening, but hosts are resilient. There are always hosts who are less susceptible than others. And in fact, many infections have no, little or no consequence. We say they're in apparent or asymptomatic. Okay, so now let's immediately define these words. What is a symptom? A symptom is what only you feel. Okay, like you have an upset stomach. A doctor can't look at you and tell you have an upset stomach. They can't run any diagnostic test and say you have an upset stomach. Only you, that's a symptom. A headache, if you're mad at someone, that's a symptom of something, but not maybe a virus infection. All right, symptoms only apparent to the patient, whereas signs can be observed by others. A rash is a sign of an infection that's obviously observable. But also, if you take blood and you measure virus particles in the blood, that's a sign of infection. You can measure the immune response, that's a sign of infection. So they can be observed by others. And of course, our ability to measure signs has gotten better over the years with, with <coughs> incredible technology a little bit of what we've talked about. So let's give an example of a virus that causes a lot of inapparent infections. Here's West Nile virus, a very interesting story, was absent in the Western Hemisphere until 1999, when it first appeared in Queens, New York City for the first time, and then birds started dying in the Bronx Zoo because West Nile virus naturally infects birds, it's transmitted by mosquitoes among birds, and now and then that mosquito will bite a human and the human gets infected. Came in the US in August of 1999. Uh, it's spread across the whole US in less than four years. There's a map of its spread, and the colors give you different levels of infections, but you can see by 2008, it's in almost every state in the US. It's gone across the country from New York State. So by October 2004, about a million people were infected. How do we know that? Did we get blood from a million people? No, of course not. That would be too much work. You get, a blood, you get blood from samples of people in different areas and you use statistical approximations to say how many people are infected. And febrile illness developed in about 20% of infected people, and about 1% of infected people, they had CNS disease, which could manifest as paralysis. So 20% of the people 
have disease. The 80% have nothing. They have an inapparent infection. So they're infected because they have antibodies, right? So the virus reproduced in them, it was injected by a mosquito, it reproduced in them, made antibodies, <laughs> but they had, they didn't feel anything. Now, you have to remember that your level of feeling something is all different. Every one of you have a different tolerance to discomfort, right? For some, some of you can have a headache that would kill someone else and you say, I'm fine, right? Because people have different tolerance for pain. So whenever you see a study of symptoms, you have to be very suspect because people vary in their tolerance for pain. But um, many, many people say, I was fine. And, um, you know, 20% didn't. And that's an example of a virus that infects a lot of people and most of them causes no apparent disease. The winner, well, there are no winners, but a, an extreme case is poliovirus, which doesn't cause symptoms in 95% of people who are infected. And there are actually some viruses that cause symptoms in no, none of the people that they infect. Now, why that is, is a, is a question that, where the reason for that is a question I can't answer for you. Because these people who don't have symptoms seem to have as much virus as the people with symptoms. So it's not a matter of how much virus you have in you. It's probably something to do with your immune response, which really causes most of the symptoms that we have. You know, the fever and the malaise and the muscle aches. It's all immune response mediated. Very few, very little of what you feel is actually caused by the virus killing cells. You know, even the runny nose, <laughs> it's an immune response to infection. It's a consequence of inflammation. Okay, now we have to talk about some important concepts in infection. One of them is incubation period. Very important, which most people do not understand. So now you will. The incubation period is the period before symptoms are obvious. Symptoms, not signs, because there are plenty of signs before the incubation period begins. So symptoms, uh, there's the incubation period in this chart where we have an infection of, of, of someone and viruses start to reproduce. That's the incubation period. So the viruses are multiplying in you during the incubation period, but you don't know it, you don't feel anything. And then all of a sudden you start sneezing or have a runny nose or a cough. That's the onset of symptoms. That's the end of the incubation period. Now. Signs are present during this incubation period. And the most obvious one is here. You can see viruses multiplying. So genomes are replicating, particles are made. The host is responding for sure. There are immediate responses to virus infection that happen in the earliest minutes after infection. You don't know it. You don't feel that until you have some symptom. Okay, so that's the incubation period. Now, another key principle here is whether a virus is transmitted during the incubation period or not. Some are and some are not. Ebola virus is not transmitted during the incubation period. So you can catch Ebola virus in Africa, you can fly to the US and you can be fine, you can have no symptoms. You're not gonna infect anyone on the plane. And then when you arrive in the US and you get symptoms, then you are shedding. And that's what happened in Dallas when a guy went from, I believe, Nigeria to Dallas. He felt sick. He went to the ER because he felt sick and he was shedding virus and he infected people because they had no idea what he had, right? Although someday if you become doctors and you're smart, you take a history. Where have you been? Immediately. I just came here from Nigeria where there happens to be an Ebola outbreak. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna uh, isolate that person, yes. Is there like a set period that you could, like that's kind of a catch-all for like, okay, like have you traveled in the last, like is it like a month, is it like six weeks, is it three weeks, or? No, it depends on the virus, right? Okay. And that's, that's actually a nice segue to the next oh, slide. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Look, incubation periods from one to two, all the way to 50 to 100. <laughs> so it depends on the disease. So if you take a history and he says, I've been in Nigeria and you know there's, and you should know, if you're a medical professional, you should know what's going on in the world, especially major stuff. You know, I, I had a nurse say to me, oh, you're a virologist, what's that? Did I tell you this? I mean, I, no, okay, I went to this, I got blood drawn and the nurse said, I see you're a virologist, what's that? <laughs> I mean, you, nursing school, I teach nursing students, 
they learn about viruses. <laughs> I had encountered another nurse once who we're talking about education. And I, I said, you know, I teach microbiology to nurses. And she said, I try to forget microbiology. <laughs> you know, healthcare is not perfect. Anyway, I, I digress. This, these are incubation periods of some viral infections. You can see influenza virus is quite short. Ebola is two to 21. So that's a big range that you have there. But the history will help you. If someone's come from an Ebola endemic country, you should suspect that. Um, then they get longer and longer. The short incubation periods are <coughs> most likely where the virus enters you and causes disease at the site of entry, like a respiratory virus infection, right? Disease comes into your nasopharynx, it comes in your nose and reproduces in, in the uh, epithelium of the nasopharynx. And then that's where the symptoms occur. So that's a short period. And then uh, viruses like measles, right? Here we go, measles, nine to 12 days. The symptoms of that are the rash, which takes nine to 12 days. I'm sorry, I forgot your question. You asked me. I was gonna ask how the eclipse of the latent period relate to the period. They don't, Be only in terms of length of the whole reproduction period, right? So the, the incubation period for a virus that takes three or four days to go through a cycle, the incubation period could be longer. But the eclipse and latent don't have anything to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's for the incubation period, how exactly is it like calculated? And is there like outlier like some people who like longer than <sighs> This is a real problem, okay? Because in the old days, you would measure well, first of all, you need to know if someone is infected, which is really hard, right? So you have to have a cohort that's at risk for a certain infection. And so during flu season, you could do that in a big city where you know people are gonna get infected. You get 500 people and you monitor them every day and you, you ask if they have symptoms. And then you can, you can see if they're shedding virus before they have symptoms. But nowadays they would do it by PCR and you have no idea because we don't know if PCR always represents infectious virus. So you would have to determine it empirically. And uh, during SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, because you have to work with the virus in a high containment, BSL-3, most people didn't measure infectivity. And it was all PCR, and I don't believe any of it. A lot of these, so the SARS-CoV-2 incubation period, I used to have one to 14 days here because that was when RNA appeared. One day, and some people got symptoms two weeks later. Now it's five to seven days because that's when uh, virus is being produced. Okay, uh, so um, some of them can be very long, as you can see. Um, you look, it takes between 50 and 100 days to develop a wart. You know, it, whenever you get a wart anywhere on your finger, anal genital warts on your feet, and if you walk around locker rooms, you should never walk around with bare feet because the floor is covered with papillomaviruses because your skin falls off, right? So wear some protection on your feet. Go in the shower with that because you will get warts. Every athlete I know it's warts on the bottom, and they're caused by viruses. They're caused by papillomaviruses with a very long incubation period. And we will talk about some of those that are sexually transmitted that can cause cancer. That's, that's really bad. But the ones on your fingers and feet and so forth, those are, those are benign. Okay, so the, the other uh, principle I want to, uh, just the definition I want to point out is what's called prodrome. Sometimes you'll see this in the literature, this word. It's the period of symptoms before those characteristic of the disease. So many virus infections start with nonspecific symptoms. We often call them flu-like because they're caused by interferon, you runny nose, cough, uh, ache muscles, brain fog, whatever. Um, those can be caused by many viruses because they're caused by the innate immune response. That's the prodrome. Then you get into something that is specific for the virus like the rash of measles. So the prodrome is the period of symptoms, so now we're past the incubation period, it's the period of symptoms before those characteristic of the disease. You'll probably never see this again, but you heard it first here. Okay, a few other things that are important to understand, because again, a lot of people don't. Morbidity, mortality, incidence, fatality. If you've taken epidemiology, you know these, you should know them, you should have been taught them. Here's a quick graphic to show you that. We have a person which represents 10,000 individuals and red is infected, determined by PCR tests, which you have to do in, a, in mass studies. It's hard to do infectivity. 
Um, then dark, no, it's orange, not red, sorry, orange is infected. Red is someone with signs or symptoms who has tested positive. And then the, the, the coffin, you know what that is, right? Um, so then we can calculate incidence, right? The incidence, the number of people infected over the number of people in a population with time. There's a time factor, like a month, a year, et cetera. Morbidity rate is the number of people ill over the number in the population. And, and if you count up the people here on this graphic, you'll get to the calculation. And then mortality rate, there's number of deaths over the number in the population, so it's very specific. But that's just in the population. The case fatality rate is the number of deaths over the number of confirmed infected people. So you have to have a positive test for those people. But that may not be everyone who is infected because of asymptomatic infection. So then we have the infection fatality rate, which is the number of deaths over the number of actual infections. Can you ever know the number of actual infections? No, absolutely not. You can never know because you can't test everyone but you can do statistical extrapolations which get you close. So it, uh, the IFR is an estimate, but it's the best that we have. So let me show you why if someone says this virus has a case fatality rate of 50%, you shouldn't necessarily worry. And the press will immediately say this virus is highly lethal as compared to one with a 1% CFR. That's wrong for you to con conclude that. Here are numbers out of China in the first uh, months of the pandemic, the COVID pandemic. And this was data published in the China CDC Weekly after 44,000 confirmed cases of SARS-CoV-2 infection. You had 1,000 deaths, which is a case fatality rate of 2.3%. All right. But if you stratify it by age, you see that the CFR goes up with age. And if you're over 80, it's, it's 15%. The virus is the same. The host is different. Can we understand this? No, not you guys. I'm just complaining about the, the outer world that doesn't understand there's so many factors in CFR, not just the virus. In fact, there's, there's sex, right? Males have a higher CFR than females. Uh, females are better protected. Obvious reasons. Yeah, they are smarter, but it's because they have the offspring, right? They're better protected immunologically. That's a well-known fact. But also location. Look at the graph on the right. This is CFR at different times during the pandemic. The earliest, so January, like the first or second month, began in December 2019, uh, and then going into February. So in Wuhan, which was the epicenter in January, the case fatality rate is almost 25%. And then in February, it is very low. You're still getting lots of infections, but they're figuring out how to treat patients. They are, their hospitals are not overloaded. All these factors count towards the CFR. It's not just the virus. And in fact, you see uh, in Hubei, the province, outside of Wuhan, very low CFR because they didn't have a lot of cases and the hospitals could take care of them. And outside in China overall, a similar uh, story with, um, with Wuhan. So many things, the age, the sex, the um, location, the hospital care that you get, and the health of the patient, of course, matters as well. If you have a lot of comorbidities, right, other illnesses, you're gonna have a different outcome with a virus infection. So do not, assume that CFR represents what a virus can do. And so many times during this pandemic, a new variant would arise, they'd calculate a CFR and say, this variant is more virulent. This is the highest level of BS I have ever heard in my life. Well, maybe not the highest, but very high up there. I can think of others as well. It's, it's only part of the equation. I, I think you get my point, right? Another uh, number you should know about, which I find a little janky, to be honest. You know, epidemiologists don't, don't do wet experiments, and I like wet experiments. They do observations, and that's good that they do their thing, but sometimes they cross over into the virus part, and it doesn't work out. So this is called the basic reproductive number. It's the number of people that an infected person can infect. It's an average in a population population 
that is susceptible. And usually you calculate this at the beginning of the outbreak when we haven't done any antivirals or vaccines or monoclonals before you have any population immunity. And so you get the baseline more or less. And then as an epidemic continues, that gets tainted because you have immunity, you have people masking and, and isolating and so forth. So how can you calculate a reproductive number, okay? And so the reason this is useful, by the way, that's the formula and it's, it includes the variables tau, which is the probability of infection, C, which is the average duration of contact. If you're you know, in a room with someone for 15 minutes versus one minute, you're more likely to get infected. And then D is how long you are shedding virus. So if shedding is longer, obviously you have a higher uh, propensity to infect other people. The, re the most useful uh, reason that this exists, in my opinion, is that if the R naught is less than one, an epidemic will not be sustained. If it's greater than one, it will be sustained. And if it's much greater, it's, it's certain. But as I said, it's, it's influenced by the time of contact between the individuals, the length of the infection period, it can be affected by interventions. And here again, the press was uh, very bad at interpreting R noughts. Well, it's, it's the epidemiologist's fault, frankly, because you know, you'd have an outbreak of the alpha variant in the UK. And the epidemiologist would say, oh, the, the R naught is now three times what the original virus was. And everybody freaks out. They say, oh, this virus is gonna go through walls. I'll get to you in a minute, hang on. I have to finish my rant, otherwise I'll lose it. <laughs> but you know, when alpha spread in the UK in December of 2020, Boris Johnson, the genius prime minister, opened up the bars and the stadiums and everything. He, said he gave people tickets to go out and socialize at the same time. They didn't take that into account for the R naught. If you have a room full of 100 people, you're gonna get transmission. If there's one person in it, you're not gonna get any. Do these take that into calculation? No, they do not. So that's the problem I have with the, public, the, um, the spreading of R naught news uh, in the press. It's not a constant. I used to show a table of R noughts for different viruses. I threw it out years ago because I realized it's not a constant. You can't compare different viruses because there's so many variables that can change the R naught. It's also estimated from a mathematical model. And every epidemiologist has his or her own mathematical model. So how could you compare them? And as I've already said, it doesn't give you an estimate uh, of how fast infection spreads. So anyway, in the beginning of the uh, pandemic, they calculated the R naught for SARS-CoV-2 based on some early results in China as two to three. So if one person could infect two or three uh, other people. Okay. So uh, how do you determine the duration of infectivity? Aha. Uh -huh. So you could do it, <laughs> you could do a human challenge study where you put a, an infected human in a room and you cycle out people for days and see how long they can be infected, but that's not ethical. So you can't do that. Um, so uh, what you do is you do studies of, say, families or classes where an infected person is introduced, and not knowingly, but happens to be. You study them, and then you watch the virus spread through the population. You see how long it takes, right? Yes? Does this have any connection to, like, I know at the beginning of the pandemic, everyone was talking about, like, what if we don't, like, vaccinate anyone? You just, like, get, like, herd immunity. Like, that obviously was not a good idea, but, like, does that have any connection to this or no? Like just let get the virus. Well, so there is a connection between what we call herd immunity, which is basically a level of immunity that depresses spread of the virus so that you, you protect other people. Um, but it doesn't work well for a virus like SARS-CoV-2 because as we learned, it undergoes antigenic variation. And so herd immunity is out the door. Yeah. But for a virus like polio, where you do get durable immunity without antigenic variation, it's more of a thing, okay? All right, anything else? Now there are what we call super spreader events where in, any, in some situation, you get a lot of transmission more than you're seeing in the greater community. And there's this one in Hong Kong early in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic where you can see that these are people who have been infected and in the middle is the person who started the whole thing. So here on the left is one person at a bar, so B stands for bar, 
And that person spread the virus to many, many other people who then spread it to others and others and others. So that's a super spreader. So that person you know, probably infected 20 or 30 persons. You can understand that, right? So maybe they're a little higher shatter than most, but they go in a crowded environment where people are right next to each other. So you don't want to blame them for being a super spreader. It's really the environment. And these are other examples of super spreader events. And they're all linked to like families or work, uh, weddings, temples, et cetera. Okay, that's a super spreader. Our first question, which of the following parameters is not influenced by human interventions? Mortality rate, case fatality ratio, reproductive number, incidence, incubation period. All right, let's see how you handled this one, or maybe how well I taught you. It's pretty good. I think it's a tricky question, but I think you listened to me. Maybe I need to rant all the time, right? Maybe that's the key. Yeah, so incubation period is fixed for the virus. There's a range, right? But human interventions don't influence that range, but we can, you know, interventions can affect the mortality rate, the case fatality ratio, the reproduction number and incidence, all of that, because you can have, um, you know, crowded hospitals and so forth, like I said. So let's talk about the, the ways that viruses cause disease. This is called viral pathogenesis. Pathogenesis is just the process of producing disease. So in this course, we're going to talk about viral pathogenesis. You could talk about bacterial or fungal pathogenesis, whatever you want. Um, it doesn't even have to be an infectious agent. And there are two components of pathogenesis. This is what the virus does, which I've already told you is minimal in terms of pathogenesis. It's not zero, but it certainly is less than the second point, which is the effects of the host response on the virus and the host. So that's our response, our immune response, causes most of the signs and symptoms of a virus infection. And when we study viral pathogenesis, which is now a major focus of virology research, dear nurse, that's what virologists do. They study viruses. How does a virus particle enter the host? What's the initial host response? Where does the replication occur? How does the virus spread? What organs and tissues are involved? Because not all are always involved. How does the host response? With interferon, antibodies, T cells, much, much more. We'll just touch that briefly. Is an infection cleared? Or is a persistent infection established? And how is the virus transmitted to other hosts? These are just some of the questions we'd like to answer about viral pathogenesis so we can better understand how disease happens and maybe intervene more easily. And there are three requirements for a successful infection. Well, at least three. You know, we're not even considering a lot of aspects of the host. You have to have enough virus. So for each virus, there's a certain amount of virus and PFU that you need to inhale or get into you in some way to start an infection. For some viruses, if you inhaled one plaque forming unit, it wouldn't start an infection because it would probably be taken by the immune response. Um, maybe you need, well, for norovirus, we need 15 PFU to start an infection. And you may ask, how do we know that? And the answer is we can do challenge studies with norovirus. You can because they don't kill you. They just make you vomit and have diarrhea for three days, which you may think would kill you, but it doesn't, right? As long as you keep drinking. So um, we know for norovirus, but for some virus, probably for SARS-CoV-2, you need more. So there was a challenge study done for SARS-CoV-2 in the UK, which I totally opposed. Not that anyone listened to me, but you have to now because that, you're my captive audience. <laughs> they said, we're gonna get young, healthy volunteers and put SARS-CoV-2 in their noses. Well, first of all, how do you know they're young? You know they're young, but how do you know they're healthy? Well, how do you know they have some underlying genetic defect that has not been manifest until you put SARS-CoV-2 in them? One of them lost, I think they had 25 volunteers, and one of them lost their taste of, of taste and smell for a long period of time, maybe forever. So I think that's not acceptable, right? And uh, how do you know you're not gonna get long COVID as a consequence? Yet the UK committee approved it, and they, 
<laughs> they pipetted. They had the people sit in chairs with their, with their heads back, and they pipetted uh, 50 microliters of virus into their noses, and then they put a clothespin on their nose, and they made them sit there for 10 minutes with this clothespin so the inoculum wouldn't drip out. Is that a natural transmission experiment? Oh my God, no. <laughs> anyway, when they put, I think 100,000 PFU into each person's nose, 100,000, half of the people got infected. Now, if, if I were designing the experiment, I wouldn't because I think it's not ethical to do that. You could do it in animals, but then you never know how that applies to humans. I would use different amounts of virus uh, and do many other things as well. Anyway, um, you need enough virus. Then the virus has to encounter cells that are accessible to the virus, like the nasopharynx, epithelium is very accessible. They have to be susceptible. They have to have receptors and they have to be permissive for infection. And then the virus has to overcome local defenses. And um, many viruses do not, and interferon probably gets rid of most infections before they get very far. You know, it turns out for, for, for severe COVID, biggest risk factor is being old. And the second biggest risk factor for severe disease is to make antibodies against your own interferons. About 20% of the human population makes antibodies against our own interferons, the defense proteins of the innate immune system. And that correlates with severe COVID and severe West Nile disease and probably many others as well. So how do they know these kids who they recruited in the UK trial didn't have that? They were lucky they didn't, but what if they did? Anyway, so these are the three requirements. But then there are other host, that's just for infection, but there are other host requirements for severe disease. The body, interestingly, has a limited spectrum of entry sites for virus infection. And they're all shown here. We have the mucosa of the upper tract, the respiratory tract, the alimentary and urogenital tract. So they're lined with um, mucosal epithelial cells. So they're exposed to the environment. Uh, then we have the skin, which is a big uh, entry point. The anus is a big entry point, a scratch or injury or an arthropod bite, and the eyes. And that's it really, not too much. And let's go through these and see how they work. The skin, biggest organ in your body. All right, the skin, the outer layer is dead. As I said before, you know, the dust you see in a room is the outer layer of everyone's skin flaking off. When you dust your furniture, that white coating is your skin. It's dead cells, it doesn't really matter, but some people find it yucky, if I may say. So that's the top layer, the stratum corneum. It's a great barrier because viruses can't reproduce in dead cells, right? So that being covered with a layer of dead cells, the next time you think highly of yourself, just remember you're walking around with an outer layer of dead cells. <laughs> we all are, but it's a great barrier to infection. So when you scratch yourself, you're letting viruses in, which we all do. We get scratches all the time from our pets or from us and so forth. So that's a great barrier. Now underneath that, uh, that's part of what's called the epidermis. And the epidermis is also composed of living cells and those can support virus infection. Uh, and then below that are lymphatic vessels and blood vessels. And um, those can certainly carry viruses elsewhere should they get through the, si the skin. Below the, ep the, the epidermis is what's called a basement membrane. It's a very dense layer of uh, polysaccharides and proteins, which is a good barrier to viruses and bacteria getting through. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Now viruses, mosquitoes spread viruses by actually, so the mosquito is a female there biting, looking for a blood meal so it can lay its eggs. And the female actually looks for a capillary to put its proboscis in, and it will probe continuously until it finds a capillary just randomly and then starts to suck the blood out. And if you have viruses in you, you will transfer them to the mosquito. But more likely the mosquito has viruses and in this probing process, so as the mosquito is probing saliva and other things are coming out of the proboscis, um, anticoagulants are coming out so you don't clot and also um, painkillers. What's the, what's the name for a painkiller? Anesthetics, thank you. <laughs> that will stop you from slapping yourself. And at the same time, viruses come out as well. So the mosquito breaches the skin 
<clears throat> goes down into the sub-epidermal tissues, which is called the dermis, and injects virus directly into your bloodstream. All right, so that's the skin. Then we have mucosal surfaces. They're lined with living cells, right? Your respiratory tract, your alimentary, your genital tracts, all lined with living cells because they have to exchange with the environment. So viruses readily get in them. So let's take a look at some of them. The respiratory tract is an example. We have, uh, it's lined with a layer of uh, epithelial cells, uh, which uh, are susceptible, can be susceptible to infection. And on top of those is a layer of mucus, which is a barrier to infection. It contains inhibitors of infection. And that mucus is present throughout your tract all the way down into your lungs. So here are some ciliated epithelial cells from down lower in the lung and the cilia beat upwards. So what you do typically is if you, you swallow very frequently, many times an hour, um, more, more times if you're nervous, but the, fun the function of swallowing is to take things from your mouth that could be dangerous and uh, put them in your stomach. And if viruses happen to get in the lung, this what's called a mucociliary elevator, it brings them back up into your mouth and you swallow them and they get digested. That's why most respiratory viruses can be found in feces. It's not because they reproduce in the intestine, but because you swallow them. They're in your mouth and you swallow them and they get digested on the way out, but the, the nucleic acid is still there, so it shows up as a PCR positivity. For most of these respiratory viruses, you will not find infectious virus in feces. And early in the pandemic, yeah, people were doing PCR and finding SARS-CoV-2 RNA in feces and saying, ah, it's an intestinal virus. No, it is not. <laughs> it's just passing through, folks. If you did a plaque assay, you would know that. <coughs> So uh, this, these cells are susceptible to infection and depending on the virus, of course, we have an upper tract where many viruses infect and the resulting infection may lead to diseases with names like rhinitis, pharyngitis, or laryngitis, which reflect the location in the upper tract. Then some viruses can move to the lower tract. They can involve the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and even the alveoli. When viruses damage alveoli, then we call that bronchopneumonia or just pneumonia. So all these cells can be infected, and these are some of the viruses that, that do that. Then we have the alimentary tract, where, of course, you're eating and putting things into the tract, which can be full of viruses. And the, the tract is lined with epithelial cells, very much like the respiratory tract. They're distinct cells, but they are epithelial cells. So here on the bottom is a cross-section of an intestine. You have the lumen of the gut there, you have the epithelial cell sheet, and then beneath it you have various tissues and you have uh, muscle cells and so forth. But this is highly vascularized, so any virus that gets through the epithelial sheet, which is on the bottom covered with a basement membrane, which we'll see in a moment, that's right up there, uh, those viruses can spread. So viruses can infect these epithelial cells, which in the gut are called enterocytes, and you can see underneath is a basement membrane, which would effectively block most viruses for, from going through it. Uh, throughout the intestine are specialized cells called M cells, which allow uh, immune cells to sample the intestinal lumen to see if there's anything foreign in there. Uh, here on the right is an electron micrograph of an M cell. Uh, it's surrounded by enterocytes and lymphocytes on the bottom, and you can see virus particles. These M cells take up material from the lumen and bring it below, and, and that's how some viruses get in. So again, this really has direct contact with the outside world because it's continuous with your mouth. It's all an open tube, and so viruses in your foods or in something you've got on your hands and, and entered into your mouth gets in there, it can replicate in these cells and cause disease. And we'll see some examples of that later. Your genital tract is another um, epithelial cell lined tract that has uh, susceptibility to infection. This is protected, again, by mucus. It has a low pH that will protect against many viruses, but abrasions resulting from, say, sexual activity can allow viruses to enter. And some of those viruses make local lesions. So the human papilloma viruses reproduce locally, and some of them may cause cancers in so many years, we'll talk about that a bit later. Uh, 
And some viruses can spread from the urogenital tract, her herpes simplex viruses, HIV, which enters the urogenital tract, can also spread uh, systemically as well. So another portal of entry. Then the eye is another one. Uh, the eye is a complex organ, of course. It has uh, many different components. But for our purposes, uh, here are some of the cells that constitute the eye that are infected with various viruses. So we have uh, the corneal epithelial cells, the cells covering the cornea. We have the actual corneal fibroblasts. Uh, those are infected with different viruses. Um, the conjunctival cell. So the conjunctival membrane covers the entire eye. And that can often be infected with different viruses. And one of the outcomes is a, a subconjunctival bleed like you see there. So that can be caused by a broken blood vessel or it can be caused by a virus infection that causes the blood vessels to lice. Uh, but this is another site uh, of infection. It's open to the environment, obviously. And you blink, the function of you blinking is to wash away material from the eye to try and get rid of it. There is a duct, a tear duct that goes from your eye into your nasal uh, passages. And that's one way to get rid of those viruses. Um, but uh, many, many infections can begin here. And we'll talk about some of those later. Don't forget the fetus. The fetus can be infected if the mother has a virus infection that virus can cross the placenta. So not every virus can cross the placenta. Some can, we call those torch pathogens. So toxoplasma is not a virus, of course, it's a parasite. It's part of the torch acronym. Rubella virus, cytomegalovirus, HIV, and Zika virus, the most recent addition to the torch lineup. All of these can pass from an infected mother's circulation. Here we have maternal circulation. They can cross the placenta and enter the fetal circulation and infect the baby. And some of these are very serious. So rubella infection of a developing fetus will result in many congenital defects in the babies. That's why we vaccinate against rubella virus to prevent all of those defects that used to happen in the pre-vaccine age. And Zika virus will cause microcephaly, babies with much smaller than normal brains. So uh, that's one way to cross the placenta. And then at birth, perinatally, when there's a lot of blood present, the virus in the blood can infect the fetus as well. The baby, no longer a fetus, of course. Okay, next question. Uh, the outer layer of which of the following is dead, but can still serve as a portal of virus entry? Respiratory tract, alimentary tract, eye, skin, urogenital tract. All right, how did we do? <laughs> what is that, number three, right? Number three, keep track. All right, well, this is an e I knew you would get 100, right? That's pretty easy, because I said you're all walking around with dead skin, right? I mean, that's got a stick, if anything. All right, so we got into the host by these various routes that I've just told you about. Now let's talk about spreading. Not all viruses spread from their initial site. Some of them remain localized. Uh, maybe the virus infects a few of these epithelial cells and then spreads along the epithelium, so a typical upper respiratory tract. Infection is like that. Common colds, mild SARS-CoV-2 infection, but other viruses can spread. Some can spread down into the lungs. Uh, many respi some re respiratory viruses can get into the blood and spread to other tissues as well. We call those disseminated infections from wherever they start. And if many organs are infected, we call this systemic infections. Now, in order to spread from the initial site of infection, you have to overcome physical and immune barriers. So the physical barrier, in many cases, is this basement membrane. So if we infect uh, an epithelial cell, the virus really cannot get through the basement membrane without it being compromised in some way. And so in some cases, the basement membrane is naturally compromised by immune processes. So to remind you, the, the intestinal epithelium is interspersed with M cells whose job is to sample, allow sampling of the lumen of the intestine. And they, they take up material by endocytosis, present it to immune cells on the underside, and cells can squeeze through the basement membrane to do that sampling. And dendritic cells can squeeze through and, and even put their processes through the cell junctions up into the uh, lumen of the intestine. 
So if, viruses, if a virus is reproducing in a neighboring cell, it could slip through uh, this disrupted basement membrane. Um, what also is important is that the virus has to be released on the basal lateral cell side of the cell in order for it to spread. So cells that are epithelial cells are polarized. They have an apical and a basal lateral domain. And if the virus is only released in the apical domain, it will not really spread through the blood or the lymph system. So here are some examples of how viruses are released. So here apically, influenza virus is released apically from the uh, intestinal tract. And polio virus uh, is released apically from the intestinal tract. Did I say intestinal for influenza? That's the respiratory tract, of course. Uh, for polio virus, it'd be the intestinal tract to be released apically to, to facilitate dispersal in, in feces. And measles virus also is released apically to allow transmission to other individuals. But basal lateral release gives you access to underlying tissues. And there's an example of uh, vesicular stomatitis virus infection of a respiratory epithelium. It is released from the bottom of the basal lateral surface and therefore it has access at least in principle to get to other tissues. Now to illustrate how this can be changed very easily, Sendai virus is a paramyxovirus, so related to measles virus, but it's a pathogen of mice. And it, if you take Sendai and you infect uh, mice with a respiratory inoculation, they get a respiratory illness and they mostly survive. That virus is released apically from the respiratory tract. You can make a one amino acid change in the spike protein of Sendai virus. It will now bud both apically and basolaterally. Now that virus spreads throughout the mouse and kills it. So a one amino acid change will allow basolateral release and that alone is enough to get the virus in other places. So th that kind of, of release is very important. So here we, then once the virus traverses the basal lateral or the basement membrane, it can then enter the circulation. So here's our epithelium, it can be infected. The basal lateral membrane can be disrupted by immune processes. I showed you that for a macrophage, but also inflammation, the recruitment of immune cells and cytokines, which we'll see later, can also disrupt that basement membrane and lets the viruses through. Then it can encounter lymph capillaries in the sub-epithelial space. Lymph capillaries are very permeable because their job is to sample the tissue and bring material to the lymph node where the immune system will then say, are there any foreign antigens here? So they have to be very permeable. So a virus can easily get into uh, a, a lymph capillary. And then of course, it'll enter a lymph node and then there, there are the efferent lymphatics that come out of the lymph node and they join up with the circulatory system. So the virus eventually gets into the blood. So the root is through the lymph system into the blood. It can also get into capillaries that are in the subepithelial space, but they are not as permeable as lymphatic capillaries. So now the virus is in the blood. The presence of virus in the blood is called viremia. And we are worried about viremia because it can spread virus to other tissues. But also, if we collect blood from people to give to other people for, for surgical procedures and medical procedures and so forth, because we haven't learned to make blood yet. So we have to make sure there's no virus that would be of danger in that blood. So for, for the more serious human infections, we make sure if there is a viremic stage that we test blood for it. So here's an example of viremia. This is an experimental infection of an animal where we inject the virus here at day zero, and then we sample the blood at different days after infection, and we measure the virus titer. And you can see that you, you infect the animal. If this is a mouse, you would inject virus into the tail vein, which is very easy to find, and then you take a mouse immediately and take some blood from it on day zero and you measure the virus and what you find there is virus in the, in the blood and that's what you've added because it's too early for the virus to have reproduced but you wanna know that you put virus in, it didn't go somewhere else or you, your syringe wasn't empty or you didn't put the wrong thing in. You need to have a time zero and many people don't do this anymore and it's bad. If you ever see an experiment without a time zero, don't believe it because you can see here that th that increase 
could fool you if you didn't have a time zero. Now on time, at day one, you could see the titers going down because the virus is disseminating in the animal and it's presumably being cleared. But then at day two, you see a little blip in, in virus again. That's what we call primary viremia. So that's virus reproducing somewhere and that spreads it to other organs. And now at day four, you get a secondary viremia because now you have a lot of organs infection. So the principle here is the virus goes in, it reproduces in a few tissues, makes a lot more virus, and that can spread the infection even more extensively. And this is illustrated in this diagram here, which is a scheme of how mice are infected with mousepox virus. So mousepox virus is a naturally occurring virus of mice. They acquire it by, uh, when they walk around on the forest floor, their little foot pads have cracks in them. You know, they can't wear anything like you can in the locker room. So they get virus coming up. The virus is, is shed by infected animals and it gets into their foot pads. And so we can mimic that infection by injecting virus into the foot pad of the mouse. And that's what's shown at the top here. So the foot pad is, an, is dead outer layer, right? But the, under it is a living epithelial cells. And so the virus reproduces in the dermis of those mice. And you can see it's now spreading through the lymph system into the blood by day three. You can measure the virus in the blood to, to confirm this. It then enters the spleen in the liver and it reproduces in them. So that first burst of virus in the blood was the primary viremia. The virus reproduces in spleen and liver and then it's released into the blood. You get a secondary viremia and that virus then goes to the skin and gives the typical pox characteristic of mouse pox virus. Okay, so that's, and you see the time course here happening on the left. So uh, that's the incubation period from seven days until you get the skin lesions. That's the first time you see symptoms, uh, well, signs of infection. The mouse can't tell you about symptoms, right? But that's, that would be a, a sign of infection. Um, that's the best you can do. So that's defined as the incubation for you. And then at the same time, the feet swell because you've put the virus uh, in there and they're having local immune reactions to it. So that's a typical virus spreading uh, through the blood. And we're gonna see that repeated in um, many human virus infections. Many human viruses target the skin and cause rashes. It's a list of viruses here, just to show you the range of RNA and DNA viruses that can cause rashes. Uh, there are rashes of different kinds. There are maculopapular rashes, like these here are maculopapular. They're, they're raised but flat. Uh, and then there are vesicular rashes like this one because you actually have a a vesicle forming on the skin, uh, and then less defined rashes like measles uh, and chickenpox. Uh, and in some cases, you can get an idea what virus is causing this by looking at the rash. But in most cases, again, the virus is brought to the skin via the blood. It begins to replicate in, in epith epithelial cells of the skin, and then there's typically an immune reaction that gives you uh, the redness in the rash. Next question is, which of the following assist in viral dissemination in the infected animal? Viremia, basal lateral release from epithelial cells, movement through the lymphatic system, inflammation at the basement membrane, all of the above. All right, how did we do? Okay, it's all of the above, right? Viremia, basal lateral release, movement through lymphatic system, inflammation, all of them are playing a role in, in viral dissemination. You can spread through nerves. So we've talked about spreading in the lymphatic system, the blood vessels. Nerves are also ways that viruses get around. And as you know, uh, we have a central nervous system comprising the spinal cord and brain, which contains the neurons, both sensory and motor neurons, which innervate muscles and which innervate areas to sense pain like the skin. And these act as pathways for viruses to travel uh, to and from the central nervous system. So you can have infections in a muscle and virus can enter the nerve and travel up to the spinal cord and cause damage in there as well. This, this ability to travel in nerves is used by neuroscientists to trace nerve pathways uh, in the brain, so or nerve circuits. So here's an example of using a green fluorescent protein tagged virus 
which you would inject in one specific part of the brain, stereotactically, very precise injection, to infect just one neuron, and then you can watch it spread synaptically and trace all the connections made from that uh, original neuron. So it's experimentally very useful. When viruses move in neurons, they do so on uh, microtubules, and they're carried by motors, the kinesin and dynein motors that move in different directions, and the virus particles are typically uh, in a vesicle coupled to these motor proteins. So they can go, for example, from a synapse or the nerve termini all the way up to the cell body, and they can be released at the cell body and move on to the next nerve as well. And when we talk about infections of the central nervous system, we use specific terms, three of them, neurotropic, neuroinvasive, and neurovirulent. A neurotropic virus simply means it can infect neural cells, can be neurons, astrocytes, glial cells, whatever you'd like, and it doesn't matter how the virus gets to them, it just tells you it can infect them. Neuroinvasive means the virus can enter the CNS. So let's say you inject virus into a leg muscle, it gets into the CNS, it's neuroinvasive. And then a neurovirulent virus can cause disease of nervous tissue. And so here are three examples. Herpes simplex virus has low neuroinvasiveness. So when you have a herpes simplex reactivation, as we'll see later, it's very rare that the virus gets into your CNS, but if it does, it's highly neurovirulent and likely to cause uh, severe encephalitis. Mumps virus, when it was prevalent before vaccination, was highly neuroinvasive. Many kids who had mumps had virus in their brains, but it, it's of low neurovirulence, so very few symptoms. And finally, rabies virus is highly neuroinvasive and highly neurovirulent. So if, if a dog bites you on the foot, it will make its way to your brain with certainty, it takes time, and that's why you can be vaccinated. And then when it gets in your brain, it, it is highly destructive unless you have been uh, vaccinated. Now viruses then travel from the, the blood vessels into tissues. So the, the nerves are a special situation where they can carry the virus right into the central nervous system. But what about the blood? We have three different situations with blood. We have situations where there's a, so the blood vessels of course are made of endothelial cells that close and make it a lumen of course. And in some tissues, cap, uh, CNS, cell toe, muscle, lungs, etc., cetera, uh, the, the blood vessel cells, the endothelial cells are tightly joined and there's a basement membrane around them. So very difficult for viruses to get across them. In other tissues, there are pores in the endothelial cells, but still a basement membrane. And then in some tissues, there's no best basement membrane and there are big gaps between the endothelial cells. So very easy for viruses to get out of these. And the liver is a typical place where it looks like this. And viruses often uh, come out of the blood into the liver initially anyway, but they don't all infect. And so this governs what kinds of infections you would get depending on whether the virus can cross these or not. Now, even in the tightest of situations, viruses can traverse the, from the lumen of the capillary to the surrounding tissues. So they can be carried in an infected uh, immune cell. So if this, this immune cell is infected, these cells naturally have the ability to squeeze through the endothelial cells and the basement membrane, so the virus can be carried in them. Uh, some viruses will reproduce in the endothelial cells. They will cause inflammation, which will cause breakdown of the basement membrane and release. And then finally, some viruses can transcytose. They can be taken up on one side of the endothelial cell by endocytosis and uh, released on the other side. So there are ways that you can get around this barrier. Now in the brain, it's very hard for viruses to get in the brain from the circulation. Only a few viruses can do that. The brain is very well protected, but once they get in, there's not much of an immune response, so they can do extensive damage. And so capillaries are protected in unique ways. They have, in fact, astrocytes uh, wrapped around them as an additional layer of protection in addition to the basement membrane and the tight junctions between the epithelial. So nevertheless, viruses have evolved to be able to penetrate through these so they can enter the brain in various places. They can enter in the brain 
from blood vessels in the brain parenchyma, the, the greater part of the brain from the cerebrospinal fluid, uh, and they can also enter from the meningeal layer in meningeal blood vessels. And then of course they can be brought in by nerves as we talked about before. So again, not a lot of viruses get in the brain, but a few do and they cause severe uh, disease. Now that brings us to the end of an infection, transmission, which is the spread of infection from one host to another, which I said earlier, you need to do that to maintain the chain of infection. That's influenced by both the virus and the host. The transmission, you know, that's part of the R0 considering both the virus and the host. In my opinion, the transmission is best described by what's called the secondary attack rate, or the SAR, the probability uh, that an infection occurs among people within a specific group, like a household or a classroom setting. And when you study those, you get the best information on transmission. Now, throughout the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, uh, variants arose regularly and as I said earlier, they were said to have higher r naughts and to be more transmissible, but I don't think that was ever proven because they never looked at the human side of the equation. What I think is that these variants are more fit or they are immune evasive, and that's why they spread uh, in the population. So fitness, what is fitness with respect to a virus infection? Just think of Darwin and survival of the fittest, right? It applies to viruses, viral fitness, Viruses that undergo changes which allow better reproduction are selected for because they're more fit. And what is fitness? It can be influenced by levels of reproduction, particle stability at different temperatures or pHs, immune evasive. And if you, I think the SARS-CoV-2 variants are all more fit and that's why they displace previous variants. Um, I don't think that they're necessarily more transmissible but that's what they're called because that's how people view it. For example, as comparison, every few years influenza virus antigenic variants arise. We understand they're more fit because they're immune evasive. We do not say they're more transmissible, yet they displace the previous viruses in the population. They have properties similar to those of SARS-CoV-2 variants, which displace other previous variants, but they're not called more transmissible as they shouldn't be. Now, among viruses, we have two general patterns of transmission, we have host to host. So human to human or animal to animal, as we see here, that, that could be humans, it could be mice, could be any animal. The virus goes from one animal to another by any of a number of means of transmission, respiratory droplets, fecal transmission, and so forth. And then we can have a vector involved. And on the right there is shown an example where a virus is transmitted among rodents by ticks. And of course you could have mosquitoes here and other kinds of uh, insects as well, but animal to animal or a vector uh, being involved. And so when we talk about transmission, we have specific terms. We have horizontal between members of the same species. So if I gave you an infection, that would be horizontal transmission. If I got an infection from a bat, that would be zoonotic transmission. Just think of zoo, right? You're getting it from uh, the animal. And there, we sometimes give infections to animals, uh, and those are called anthroponoses, or I like to call them reverse zoonoses because it's too hard to say the other word, but that happens too. Vertical is between mother and child, typically transplacentally or at birth. Iatrogenic is when an activity of a healthcare worker make, gives you an infection. And, and nosocomial is a more general term when you get an infection in a hospital. And finally, germline transmission is when the, the agent comes as part of your genome. So the retroviral DNA is integrated into your genome and you pass it on to your offspring because it's in your germ cells. That's germline transmission. So here's a, a diagram that shows horizontal transmission among I don't know what they are, sheep, and the, yeah, sheep, and then a vertical transmission from the mother to the offspring. Now to transmit you have, in, in some cases you have to shed, but not always. And here are the different ways you can shed respiratory droplets, skin lesions, the blood if you have a scratch or injury and you're shedding blood onto someone else, uh, urine, semen, feces, but shedding is not always needed. 
you can get infected via the blood supply. So there you've taken blood from someone and given it to another person. So it's technically not shedding. Intravenous drug use where a contaminated needle transmits infection, insect vectors, germline transmission, or vertical mother to baby, I would say the transplacental because when birth happens and there's blood everywhere, that's technically shedding of the virus. And when you shed from a respiratory infection, you involve respiratory secretions, which are droplets that you make by coughing or sneezing or speaking. And you can see that backlit photograph illustrates that there are many different sizes of droplets that are made and you don't have to sneeze and cough to do this. I am making droplets now, and you are by breathing. You're exhaling droplets, and so you can transmit viruses in those droplets. And the droplets are different sizes, and they go different distances, and the smallest ones can go up to 160 feet, and not many viruses are in those. Measles virus is one that can get in those small droplets and go very far distances. But the intermediate-sized droplets, three to five feet, that's why you see stickers in the elevator six feet apart, because it's an average size. This obviously is a continuum. The droplets don't fall exactly into these sizes, but there is a continuum. And then for some viruses, nasal secretions contaminating hands, tissues, subway poles, recruits pyruvate kinase into the vesicle so that it can supply energy for the helicase. So that completes our trip through an infected cell shedding and transmissibility, right? I remember I told you at the very beginning that some viruses transmit during the incubation period and some do not. And that's very important because if you are transmitting during the incubation period, which is defined as the period before symptoms appear, you're likely to be out and about in the world because you feel fine infecting other people. That's why SARS-CoV-2 was so difficult to control because people were doing shedding during the incubation period. So here are three viruses where we look at the relationship between the incubation period uh, and shedding. So here is the original SARS of 2003, SARS-1, where you have the days from symptom onset. So here's uh, symptom onset. The shedding starts here and it's this, this curve here and the peak of shedding is right there. And for this, uh, the start of shedding is after symptom onset. So symptom onset is the beginning of this uh, purple color. So these people didn't shed in the pre-symptomatic period. And when they got sick, they were put in hospitals and contained. So that never became a pandemic because it was relatively easy to find the infected people. Now, SARS-CoV-2, uh, by contrast, symptom onset starts at the peak of shedding. And you shed for a number of days before symptom onset. And so there's the problem that it's transmitted during the pre-symptomatic phase and also from asymptomatically infected people. And for comparison, here's influenza virus where you have about a day or so of viral shedding before uh, symptom onset. So that's a big problem when you have viruses that are shed during that uh, pre-symptomatic period. All right, last question is, which statement about transmission is wrong? A, all virus transmissions are trans, all virus infections are transmitted by shedding. B, the route is determined by the site of virus shedding. C, transmission is required to maintain a chain of infection. Speaking can produce an aerosol that can transmit infection. Horizontal transmission is among members of one species, which is wrong. How did we do here? Yeah, close. All virus infections are transmitted by shedding is wrong. You know, blood supply, intravenous drug use, uh, germline, those are not shedding. The rest are good examples of that. All right, now what else, what else can influence virus infections? Just have a few minutes here, let me go through this. Geography, where you are can influence where, uh, how an infection can occur. And that is because of the vector that transmits the virus. So in this case, it's a virus called chikungunya virus, which, um, it illustrates this very nicely. It's, uh, it was originally transmitted by a, a mosquito called Aedes aegypti, but then it shifted to a new species called Aedes albopictus, uh, which was introduced in the US in the 80s by the tire trade. It came into Houston and it spread throughout certain states, as you can see by the coloring there. So chikungunya virus is a plus strand RNA virus. It is spread originally by Aedes aegypti. It gives you rash, fever, joint pains. 
when you get infected. It was originally only described in Asia, Africa, but never Europe or the US. In 2004, outbreaks began to spread from Kenya to India and beyond. And then in 2007, it spread to Italy and since has gone throughout Europe. And what happened was a single amino acid change in the viral glycoprotein caused the virus to reproduce better in Aedes albopictus, which had a broader range than Aedes aegypti. And that's why the range of this virus expanded. Um, in the US, we used to have, we now have many states reporting mainly imported cases. People travel to a country where there is chikungunya and then they bring it back and you know they're incubating and then they get the disease in the US. But the range of Aedes albopictus includes Florida and Texas. And now we have seen local transmission in Florida and Texas, as well as Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. And you know, with climate change and warming, the range of this mosquito is gonna increase. So we're gonna have more of these kinds of uh, vector-borne diseases. Uh, seasonality, virus infections are seasonal. Uh, you can see here in rubella, when it was prevalent, would, would occur in very specific waves during the year. Influenza up, up in the US occurs during the winter. Even polio virus occurs in specific places depending on the latitude. And for the most part, we don't understand the effect of season on virus transmission, except for influenza virus, where some uh, experiments have shed some light. So when you expel droplets and they are suspended in the air, they tend to evaporate and become very small droplet nuclei, which can spread farther. And so an experiment was done where transmission of influenza virus among guinea pigs was looked at. So we have percent transmission here on the y-axis and they changed the temperature and the relative humidity. And you can see at, uh, at the low temperature, five degrees, low relative humidity is associated with very good transmission. Then when the humidity goes higher, the droplets take on water and they fall to the ground. And so it doesn't transmit well. So the winter time is the best season for flu in these temperate zones because it's low relative humidity and it's cold. And those preserve the virus in these smaller droplets. So we think this probably contributes to seasonality, but Flu is also seasonal in the tropics where there's no winter. So again, we don't really know what's going on there. Okay, next time we'll take a look at what happens in the earliest minutes of infection in terms of host response.